to another service this evening. We want to continue our teaching. We have stopped last Wednesday or two days ago concerning what happened in the Garden of Eden. We want to continue from there. Two days ago, we saw how they fell in the garden. We saw what happened between our mother Eve and the serpent. And we also saw how the father Abraham and father Adam came to get involved. Before I move on from there, let me just fire our imagination a little bit about the serpent. Because of this notion in Christendom that the serpent was originally a snake. And that's why when you see all these drawings in all these so-called Christian pictures, you will see Adam and Eve under a tree and you will see a snake wandering that tree with apples in his mouth. It is wrong. It tells a wrong story. As I told you on Wednesday, two days ago, the serpent in the scripture of Genesis chapter three verse one was a creature looking very much like a man. In practically every way, just looking like a man. And I explained to you his origin from the first creation of God of Genesis 1-1. Because we don't have time in the evening hours for our Wednesdays and Friday services, I cannot really go too deep because I'm rushing for time. But let me just ask you to think about something that all of us know. It's called the chimpanzee. We all know what a chimpanzee looks like. I ask you, if you move into the woods, some people call it forest. If you move into the woods and you suddenly come in contact with a chimpanzee, let's be honest. Who would you be looking at as you come into that encounter? The truth is, as the chimpanzee is just standing in between the uh, branches of the tree and he's standing there on his on his feet, you would think that you are looking at a man. An ugly man, perhaps, yes, but definitely looking like a man. That's a chimpanzee. But remember, by Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent was superior to the chimpanzee. So if today, even in this 21st century, the chimpanzee looks like a man, because you know it can stand erect. It can also go on force, but it can stand erect as well. So if today chimpanzee looks to any one of us like a man, how will it be the one that is superior to the chimpanzee? That is just to let you know that we should stop all these things of thinking that uh, the serpent was a snake. In science today, there is something they call the missing link. In science, you can check it out on your own. The missing link. What does science mean by missing link? Science by missing link is saying that when the science checked creation and look from the insects, animals, and just see the pattern of their development from the smallest thing you may call an insect or whatever name you call those things on the earth, and science looked at it. They saw that there is always the same type of gap from one stage to another, one stage 
to another, one state to another, one state to another, that it's always the same type of gap between them. However, this gap remained exactly the same until chimpanzee. Then between chimpanzee and man is this wide gap. So science calls it the missing link. Science believes that there's something between the chimpanzee and man. And when we try to tell them from the scriptures that that missing link is the serpent, of course they dismiss us and they get out. But till today, science has not found the missing link. Even right now, they are still, they are still working on it. But the missing link is the serpent. Put in the serpent there now, and you find that that thing in creation, from the animals, from the smallest to the biggest, you find it is all intact. But that thing is missing between the chimpanzee and man. I just want us to put that at the back of our mind as we go on with this teaching today. So let's turn our Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter, chapter 3, which is where we were dealing what we're dealing with last uh, on Wednesday. Where we went off on Wednesday was where their eyes were open in verse 7 after committing the sin. Their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked and they sold fig trees together and made themselves aprons. This is where we ended two days ago. And I just want to repeat what I told you two days ago. Eyes were opened, they knew that they were naked. What was the difference? Because in Genesis 2.25, the Bible says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So it is not as if it's in Genesis chapter 3 that Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve knew they were naked. No, no, no. They knew it as soon as God put them in the flesh, following the formation of Adam in Genesis 2.7. Remember always, Adam was created a spirit being. When Adam was created, that very moment that Adam was created, that very split second that Adam was created, that was when every human being that will pass through this earth was created, including you and me. That very moment. We were created in the loins of Adam. That was why when Adam fell, all of us fell. Why? Because we were inside of him. That is what today we glibly call the original sin. We were inside of the loins of Adam when he fell in the Garden of Eden. So but at that time that God put them in the flesh, Adam and Eve knew that they were naked. No question about that. They were naked and it did not bother them. At that point they were naked, they were actually under a veil of purity. So they could see absolutely nothing wrong with how they were and what was what was on their body. They couldn't see anything wrong. However, when they now committed sin, the situation changed. The situation changed because their Conscious, when God 
created man, he put a conscience inside of us. That moment that they sinned, the conscience was awakened, was activated. And they knew, yes, we have done something wrong. That veil of purity that covered them, that they were naked, I didn't know it, they didn't, um, they, were, they knew it, but they were not ashamed. The moment the pangs of conscience hit them, and all of you know that when pang of conscience hits us, it's to say to us, ah, you've done something wrong. So at that moment, they knew they had done something wrong. That veil of purity was torn apart, and that's why they became ashamed because they now knew that they, what they had done was actually quite bad. You see, that is what we must understand. And that is how the shame came about. Let me just deviate for maybe a minute here. Remember when God created Adam and Eve, I want us to, um, it's not part of what we are doing today, but I just want us to begin to think. When Adam and Eve were created, and then God formed man from the dust of the ground, and then brought Eve through the rib of the man, as we just saw moments ago, they were naked, they were not ashamed. Therefore, God brought man into this earth without any clothes on. Do you hear me, people? God brought us into this earth without any clothes on. God does not change his mind. When he was the Elohim, self alone, when there was not, nothing created, no universe in existence, God decided how man, how he was going to create the earth and how man will be in the earth to rule over the earth. And that man that God created, he was naked. He didn't need any clothes. He didn't have any building. That is to show you that that's God's plan for his earth. Then something happened. That veil of purity that covered man was broken when the sin happened in the Garden of Eden. And it became necessary for man to find a covering. What I'm trying to explain to you is this. Someday, that day is still coming. When Adam was created, I said to you on, on Wednesday, he was created a child of eternality. He was in the eternal realm. Then the fall came. And so Jesus Christ is going to come to wipe away the curse in the Garden of Eden when he will create, when he will set up his kingdom of heaven on earth after the war of Armageddon. That kingdom will last a thousand years, what we call the millennial reign of Christ. And after it, there will be the white throne judgment from Satan through, through all his demons and all the bad people of, of on this earth since creation begin with Cain. all of them will be cast into the lake of fire and god is going to ruin everybody there the bad people there this is all in revelation 20 21 22. go and read it when you get home then you see there's going to be when we move from the white throne judgment, 1 Corinthians 15, 28, we happen. The sun 
will hand over to the Father and God will be all in all. You see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 28. That is the point at which we go back into eternity. But before that happens, God is going to cleanse heaven and earth with fire. Why heaven? Because remember the rebellion of uh, Lucifer, it affected heaven's space in heaven. And you remember the fall in the Garden of Eden, earth. So before we go to eternity, before we go to eternity, God will burn away everything that has come from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I'm, I need to inform you that among those things that came from the tree of knowledge and evil are the clothes that we wear, are the houses that we live in. When we get into eternity, we shall not wear any clothes. We shall not live in any houses. We are going to be exactly as it was when God established us on this earth in the time of Adam. Please put that at the back of your mind because God's word does not change. Okay, that's just, as I said, that's just an aside for you to understand what God is doing. So you see, as I said on Wednesday, when Adam and Eve knew that they had sinned, the first thing they did, they cut fig leaves and they covered their private parts. So that should make you to ask yourself, if they chopped fruit, as everybody is saying in Christendom, that it is fruit. I know that nobody eats fruit from his or her private parts. You eat fruit from your mouth, your mouth and your tongue and your teeth, not your private parts. So if it's your mouth and your tongue and your, and your teeth, if they were the things that committed your offense, how come what they were covering now was their private parts in the anatomy? That shows you clearly that what we are talking about has nothing to do with the mouth or the teeth. It has to do with down below. And that's why they covered that area. Please remember that. And the main point I made yesterday, uh, Wednesday, I said the moment Adam and Eve covered their private part, it's not because of private now, private part now, but just because they said, hey, we have done wrong. We have sinned. He told us not to do so. That the day we do it, we shall surely die. Hey, so the time of death is come. This so touched them. Obviously, you can see that they felt bad, which means, oh, we shouldn't have done it. And so the first thing they could think of doing was to go and grab fig leaves, and then they covered their nakedness. They knew that God was going to come to them and say, okay, let us do something that will please God. Their own idea, not God's own idea. So their own idea was, let's get the fig leaves and cover ourselves. And as soon as they did that, my brothers and sisters, as soon as they did that, religion came into man's affairs. That was the origin of religion. Will worship, worship according to the will of man, not according to the will of God. And we shall see God's reaction to it today. But please put that at the back of your mind. That is the origin of religion. Okay? All right. So today, let's begin from verse 8, where we want to read. 
And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, can I continue? And Adam, and Adam and his wife, we just had NEPA problem. NEPA just, so, but we are trying to put on the, uh, uh, the generator, so don't worry. And NEPA and uh, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. So you see, now they have gone to hide themselves among the trees. Verse 9, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? So let, let's, take, let's take that now. God called him, Where art thou? And in verse 10, and Adam said, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. Verse 11, and he, meaning God, said, who told thee that thou was naked? Has thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Okay. So let's take what we have seen, what we have read so far now. And I just want to expatiate on this. The Bible says, God came walking in the garden of Eden in the cool of the day. We all know that Adam, and Eve, God used to come and fellowship with them in the cool of the evening. The point I'm trying to make to you now is that Adam and Eve knew God in a certain form. We don't know in what form, but definitely Adam and Eve we're seeing God face to face. God will appear in a form. That form is what we call theophany. That is God appearing in a certain form. If you notice from Genesis all the way into the New Testament, God was always appearing to man in so many forms, various forms, in the form of a man, in the form of light, cloud, and so on. When they took on this theophany, then it's just like the picture of a man. You saw him when they appeared to uh, Father Abraham in Mamre. You saw him directly in context with Jacob leading the children of Israel out of Egypt in the daytime pillar of light, the night pillar of cloud, in so many ways. But the moment Jesus Christ stepped foot on this earth, if you observe, nobody, scripture never has said God was appearing anymore because now God has chosen a permanent form in which to be appearing. And that is the form that you and I call the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why we know that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. God hiding under the flesh of man. God walking on two feet on this earth. So we must understand that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. So God came and then was asking them, say, Adam, where are you? Some people may wonder, if it's God, why was he asking Adam, where are you? That's just foolishness on the part of any such person. That was a rhetorical question. God asked, asked it deliberately, he already knew the answer. You remember that, that this God we are talking about, he's omniscient because he knows everything. 
is also omnipresent because it's, it fills every space. There's no space in the universe that God is not there present. So God was just asking them rhetorical, rhetorical question. Adam, where are you today? Where are you today? And then Adam answered him by saying, he heard his voice and decided to hide because he was naked. God said, naked? How do you know you are naked? That's what we are, where, where the trouble, yes. Mm -hmm. So I was naked and hid myself. When you listen, when you reflect on that answer by Adam, you will notice a hint of repentance there. There was no gragra like in the case of Cain, as we see later. God was asking, where is the God? I said, ah, why are you asking me? Am I my brother's keeper? Which one for Sam is my brother? You can see there's a different spirit then. Adam there was saying, I heard your voice and I hid myself because I'm naked. You can see it's the voice of somebody who acknowledges that he has done wrong and is sorry for doing wrong. That is why he's in heaven today. Because some people always say, uh, if Adam committed that sin, he did not hidden. Therefore, Adam and Eve will be in hell. No, they are not in hell. They repented. And if you and I are in sin today, and we, are, we choose to repent, in the same way that God forgave Adam and Eve, God will also forgive us as well. And allow the blood of his son to wash us clean. So I can stand before him. All right? Okay. So that was it. God said, eh? Who told you you are naked? Hey, Adam, how do you know you are naked? Adam said, verse 12. And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to me, who thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did it. Yeah. Who told you are naked, Adam? He said, that the woman that you gave me, Lord. She is the one. She gave me of the tree, and I did it. And God turned to Eve in verse 13 and said, what is this that thou hast done? Talking to Eve in verse 13. What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did it. Do you notice? Adam said, God, it is the woman you gave me. Otherwise, I was innocent. As you see me, so I did nothing wrong. But this woman you gave me, that I need the woman, God, there was no time I complained to you that I needed any woman. Now you say you will give me a helpmate. Eh? It is this helpmate now that has put me into this trouble. God said, eh, all right, helpmate. What did you do? Why did you do it? Everybody said, ah, God, is the serpent who he beguiled me and I did it. Check their stories together. Who were they accusing? Adam and Eve. They were accusing God. Check it out. God. Adam was accusing God for creating Eve. And Eve was accusing God for creating the serpent. <laughs> you see? So, so, in either case, it is God that they put the whole thing on top. Say so if you do not, if you don't create this woman, I will not fall. I do. I said, if you don't create serpent, how will who will have come to be guide me? So we need to understand what what has been well, what what the matter is. Then look at the next verse. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, do you notice something? God did not ask the serpent, 
Why did you do it? He asked Adam, what happened? He asked Eve, what's going on? Adam, what's going on? Eve, what, what happened? The serpent, the third one in the equation, God did not bother to ask any question. God just went straight to curse him. Verse 14, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shall thou go, and dust shall thou eat all the days of thy life. Now we need to explain that a little bit. First, why did God no bother to ask the serpent for his own side of the story? He asked Adam for his story. He asked Eve for her story. But he never gave the serpent a chance. Why? Very clearly. Simple matter. God, God knew that the serpent, although he was created good animal, head of the animal world, God knew that as at that moment, Satan had possessed the serpent. And there was not a single truth that will come out of the serpent. Because at that moment, yes, when you are looking at that creature at that moment, it was the serpent. But every other thing inside of him was Satan. Yes. When you look at Jesus Christ, what are you seeing? You are seeing a man. But everything inside of Jesus Christ is God. So Jesus is the man aspect, Christ is the God aspect. So in the garden there, as you are looking at the serpent, yes, we are seeing the features of that man looking animal, the serpent, but every other thing inside of his realm there was absolutely of Satan. Satan had completely taken him over. And God knew that it's a waste of time asking him because he would lie. Why? Because what is inside of him is of Satan. And what did God say about Satan? Let's turn to John chapter John chapter 8, and let us read verse 44, so that you understand. John chapter 8, verse 44. John 8, 40, 44 says, this is Jesus now talking with the scribes and Pharisees. He said, ye are of your father, the devil, and the loss of your father, ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. You will see that Jesus Christ was talking about the devil. He called him a murderer from the beginning. And many times, many of us, when we read this scripture, our minds will go straight to Cain. But that's not what Jesus was saying there. He was referring to the devil as a murderer from the beginning because what he did to bring the earth into the condition as we see it in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. You know, a lot of lives perished on the earth. And for it to happen, 
He told a lot of lies right there at the beginning when he was trying to get the angels to follow him in rebellion against God and to get the people on earth to follow him also. He was lying. When you go to Ezekiel, Ezekiel uh, 28, we don't have time for all of this now, but when you go to Ezekiel 28, you will see where all of that is written. When you consider what the Bible was referring to in Ezekiel 28, say verses 16 and 18, talking about the merchandise of Lucifer. His merchandise were all these lies, propaganda that he was telling about God to turn the minds of the people against God so that they follow him. That's why Jesus Christ called him here now the father of lies. And he's a liar and a murderer all the way from the beginning. So, that, so God, seeing that the serpent was completely under the control of Satan, there was no need to ask him any question. God just went straight away and started to curse him. Again, now I want to, to draw attention to something that we overlook many times. He says, Cursed are thou above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shall thou go, and thus shall thou eat all the days of thy life. Cursed are thou above all cattle and above every beast of the field. When you go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Lord God had made. And as I explained to you, his origin, I showed you was a towering figure, a real martial man. So this cost, I was saying, cost are down above all cattle that you are a towering figure above all these animals. But now, from that being high that you are above all the cattle which made you the head of all the animal kingdom there, I'm going to bring you from that place and bring you down to the lowest form. And that's why it says, from now on, you go on your belly. If you are going on your belly, can, there be, can you go lower than that? You can't. That's the lowest you can go. So that's the meaning of that curse. I hope, I hope you catch that. Eh? All right. So then God cursed him. Upon thy belly shall thou go, and thus shall be, and thus shall thou eat all the days of thy life. I tell you something, brethren. If you live, if I live to please God on this earth, we shall know the serpent. You are saying to yourself, how? God has caused him, he said, now a snake. How good to know him. Come with me to Isaiah. Isaiah 65, verse 25. Isaiah 65, verse 25. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 25. Verse 25 is the last verse of Isaiah 65. I read, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. This is where we are going to now. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. When we get to the millennium, when Jesus Christ, when we have come down, we go in the rapture, then we spend seven years in heaven with Christ after rapture, then heaven is emptied of every form of human occupation from Adam and Eve down. All of us will return back to Jesus Christ to this earth. 
the army of Jesus coming down with Jesus along with some angels to come and defeat the Antichrist and his forces at the Battle of Armageddon. When we have finished that, Jesus Christ will now declare the establishment of the kingdom of heaven on this earth. The kingdom where he will then be the king. That is the moment he will now be the king of kings and lord of lords. Okay. Huh? Later. So when we do that, when we get there now, that's millennial. From the moment we enter into that millennium, we shall no longer eat meat. We shall go back to the food of Adam and Eve in the garden, which is herbs and fruit. And all the animals that God created, they also were feeding on some herbs. At the time of Adam and Eve before the fall, no lion was consuming any other animal or attacking man. No rules, nothing. Everybody was at peace. So when Jesus Christ comes back with us to establish on this earth, he is going to bring everything back as it were in the days of Adam in the garden of Jesus. So for those 1,000 years and into eternity, there will be no animal coming to eat anybody and all that. The Bible says in Isaiah, children will put their hands inside the mouth of wolves. Nothing will touch them. They will come and put their hands into the wolves where they know that some wicked snakes are there. Nothing will harm them. They will go back and eating the straws that were supposed to be eaten. No flesh. However, for the serpent, he will continue to lick dust. So in the millennium, where you and I are there, because all these animals will be around us, they are not attacking us, we are not attacking them. When we see the one crawling and it's licking dust, you and I will know that that is the serpent. God did not destroy the serpent. He merely turned him from I brought him down to that level of a snake to the crawling. Am I on the right leg? And that is exactly how they're going to be all through eternity. So we will know the serpent. I want you to know very clearly that the early children of Adam and Eve, they knew the serpent. And they knew his story. So we also by revelation, we know the story, but we shall now see his yes. death. Yes. There's a question here. The question is, does it mean that serpent will go into eternity? The Bible is not clear. And also, where the Bible is silent, we should be silent. One thing we know that the serpent will be there all through the millennium. That is for sure. Will he now go into eternity? The Bible did say so. I have my doubts if he will go, but the Bible did say so. The reason I have my doubts is that God will destroy Satan before we go to eternity. And this thing I just told you now, let it not surprise you. I know that most of you talk about hell as being eternal. It is not true. There is no Bible that says hell is eternal. Because if we go and read Revelation, hell and death will be thrown into the lake of fire. And that's where they will be destroyed. In eternal, in eternality, nothing bad, nothing evil can exist there. Because eternal life is of God. And Jesus Christ is the one that is the figure of eternal life. 
So I doubt if uh, I doubt if the serpent to go into eternal eternal life. But we will know him through the one thousand years reign of Christ on this earth because he will be crawling around and he will be licking dust. Okay. So let's quickly move now. Then, so God caused him this martial, huge fellow, head of the animal world at the time. God caused him, and from that place, God took all his limbs, legs, and arms, put them inside, and he started crawling on his belly. Okay. Now, by the way, in archaeology, in archaeology, you know, archaeology is the science of unearthing things under the earth to see how things were of old. I read the report whereby in archaeology they discovered the skeleton of a certain of a certain type of snake. And the legs and the arms were all inside. Could that be how the serpent was after the cross? We don't know. But archaeology certainly has certainly on earth that kind of uh, all these old things that under the ground. So when God caused him and became a is a snake. God did not stop there. And this is why it's important for us to understand. So let's look at verse 15. God still cursing the cursing the serpent. Verse 15 it says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise <coughs> his heel. Let's go back again. God said to the, to the serpent, while cursing him, he has reduced him to a snake now, to so something crawling on his belly. And God says, I will put enmity between thee. That is between thee. That thee, that is thee. Serpent now turned to snake. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. So now I'm going to make you an enemy of the woman and the woman your enemy. Okay? Right. And between thy seed and her seed between the seed of you serpent and the seed of the woman is this seed talking about serpent being an agronomist a farmer who is into seedlings what is the seed here seed here simply means offspring simply means your child I will put enmity between thy child, you serpent. I will put enmity between your child, you serpent, and between your child and the child of the woman. So, how come that they chop apple with their mouth? And God, in cursing, cursing the serpent, is talking about his child, Abba. Do people give out from the mouth? Do they just eat something in the mouth and pregnancy will occur? This is to explain to you that what happened in Garden of Eden had nothing to do with the mouth. It all had to do with the genitals of man and woman with our private parts. Simple. They said with the woman, and God said, I will put enmity between your children and 
between your child and the woman's child. So why? Not only this thing we, we talk, and we are talking about that. Okay? So put that at the back of your mind. And it shall bruise thy head that in the seed of this woman, the child of this woman, will bruise the head of the serpent. And the serpent will bruise the heel of the child of the woman. This bruising thing was what happened on the cross of Calvary. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ, on behalf of man, triumphed over Satan, bruised his head. And Satan, in turn, bruised the heel of Jesus through the crucifixion. I hope you understand what this thing is now. But now, listen to what Kali Church has done. This scripture that is so clear, Kali Church now says that it is not Eve, it is Virgin Mary. That Virgin Mary bruised the head of Satan. And so Satan bruised her head. What has it got to do with Virgin Mary? So, so what has Virgin Mary got to do with this? Absolutely nothing. But one point something, over one point six billion of people who go to church as Catholics, kind of nonsense that they have to believe. Isn't this thing so clear? Where is Virgin Mary in this picture here? This thing is talking, the seed of the woman is Jesus Christ. And the battle of Calvary was between Jesus Christ and the Satan and, and, and Satan. In the Garden of Eden, there it was the serpent that was standing in for Satan. That's all. All right, let's move forward. On verse 16 now, unto the woman that is Eve, God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So God has finished causing the serpent. Now we turn this attention to the woman. So what did he say? To the woman. And let me explain something quickly. Some of you in your hearts now, you are still saying, eh, but how? Okay, okay, okay. Let's assume that that happened was standing in right like man. Eh, but the animal, how animal become? Let me, let me talk it plainly. How can animal now have sex with human being? Have you not heard the word bestiality? Turn to your dictionary, turn to your Google. Bestiality means human being having sex with an animal. Some of these are our daughters who go abroad, sell their fathers and their mothers land to rush abroad because they think uh, that's where they will make fortunes. Your daughter goes abroad in January. In March, same year, she begins to send you every month $500. Say, mommy, please use hundred for yourself. 
Then 400, change it, keep it. After six months, you have enough money left to go and buy land. You must build house in the village. Two months, your pretty daughter has gone abroad and she's now beginning to send you money. I can tell you without wondering whether you're angry or not, your daughter is a prostitute. Because you can't make that kind of money neither in Europe nor in America. No matter your qualification, you come out from Africa. And you know, you smuggle yourself in there, illegal immigrants. So there are some people, it's their business, who are criminals. They get at you and they say, well, you don't want me to report you to the home office, do my wishes. And for these guys, what they do, they launch them into prostitution. They take their passports and everything. And they send them to men to go and eat. The men will not pay them. The men will pay to send them. And then and they agree to another weekly or two weeks or every fortnight, every two weeks, every month, you calculate what you, you earn and they give you. Those of them who make more money are those who agree to, uh, to sleep with animals. Because the, what they don't realize is that they are photographing them. This is what they use as pornography in other places. All these girls out there, they know that they use dogs to enter into these girls. Or a poor woman, you find her with her dog. You start wondering, what is so special? Now you savvy. They train this dog so well, she has no husband, she has nothing. But this girl drunk is to die. So that when they die, they will make a will and leave everything to the dog. Those are stupid, people can be. So they train these dogs very well. When it's time to go to bed, they lie down and the dogs know what to do. The dogs come on top of them and enter into them. So dogs know how to enter into women. So if dog on four, on four legs can do that, what about monkey? What about chimpanzee? Because I don't have time. When I was teaching this same subject to our little fellowship group here, yeah, I had photographs to show them, newspaper records. For example, one that happened in Oshu State. In a village, you know, some of these local uh, village hospitals, uh, it's not hospital, I, call it, I don't know what they call it, health center, something like that. Reports started coming from the nurses that a certain chimpanzee will come late at night, jump through the window and carry away the nurse on duty, run into the woods and rape her. The not kill her, rape her and deliver. These reports became frequent, so the villagers set up a trap. They've got themselves armed and everything. And they set the trap, so it will be like, it's only that nurse that was on duty that night. And true enough, the chimpanzee came, looked around nobody, jumped in. As soon as he carried this nurse to go, the villagers sprang on him and they killed it. So I ask you, who directs the chimpanzees to know where the private part of a woman is to be able to go into her? I'm not talking about bad days. I'm talking about 21st century, 20th and 21st century. If chimpanzee is doing that, so think about an animal that was higher than the chimpanzee as a serpent. 
and you say it cannot go into, into it, why do we want to be deceiving ourselves? The simple truth is that there is something called bestiality today, and it is sex between man and animal. So let nobody begin to think, ah, no such thing is there. There is. And so we know that the serpent went into Eve, no question whatsoever about that. So we cannot even debate it. That's why God cursed the serpent and moved it from being standing erect like a man and managed to begin to crawl on his belly. Then God turned to the woman and said, Unto the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring, thou shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Okay. See now, we are going to stop in 10 minutes. So, the woman. It's done, it's done wrong. And God now wants to curse the woman for her wrongdoing. God did not curse the mouth or the teeth with which she chopped up or whatever was the fruit. Instead, all the curses of God against women had to do with a reproductive system. However, which are concerned with the system and mouth? God was talking here about the, this, this thing that we, our sisters call period, the multiplier of a woman. God says it will be multiplied and it will be painful. Which woman today, when the period is there, is basically laughing from ear to ear. At all, you know that you are in pain. So you know exactly where you got the pain from. So perchance, if you make heaven through the rapture, when you get there, try and talk to Mama Eve, say, this is where you do go to. See what now so far down there, you can tell her. Anyway, so you can see straight away there that it had to do with the productive organ. And then God also talks about conception. How does a woman get conceived? It's through the sexual act. So everything the Bible is describing there is telling us about intercourse. So this scene was clearly only about intercourse. There's nothing else there. So let everybody just be very clear in their minds that that is what, what happened there, okay? So God now possessed the woman you will suffer. And that's why when you go to First Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the only thing that Paul was saying, I cannot read it now because of time, but please read that too. First Timothy 2, 15. He said, Woman, you cannot preach in the church. Just be a good wife. And God will enable you to be delivered of your children safely. So that is all that it's, that is all for you as a woman to know that God has given you. In your conception, you have pains, you have sorrow until you deliver. But nothing to do with mouth. If you look at Exodus, with the Exodus yourself when you get to Rome, Exodus 21, verses 23 to 25. And if you read Revelation 13, verse 10, I want to repeat Exodus 21, 23 to 25, Revelation 13, verse 10. You will see God's just sense of justice. That's why they did not eat with the mouth, so God did not punish the mouth. The part of the body that they used to commit the sin. That is the part that God punished. That is scripture. I just gave you concerning that. So let's finish with Adam. So, and then God said to the woman too, He said, uh,
thy desire shall be to thy husband. That is very clear. He's saying, from now on, your yearning shall be for your husband. You keep yearning for your husband. You crave to have your husband all the time around you. You know, your desire shall be subject to your husband, implying perhaps that she had learned a lesson and will, be, and will consider him in her future actions. And he shall rule over you, simply means he shall be your boss, he'll be your lord, he will lord it over you. And that is to show you that when God created Adam and Eve, he created them that they were already equal. But because of what happened now, God says, from now on, your husband shall rule over you. If it was how it was from the beginning, there was no need for God to say it. It only means that when he created them, he was supposed to be equal. You know, but I will do what to do. So from now on, we put that the husband will continue to rule over you. Okay, let's end up now, verse 17. And unto Adam, God said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cost is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shall thou eat of it all. Now thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. I'm going to end here. But before I end, let me ask you. You are going to say to yourself, if the serpent committed adultery with Eve, that is clear. And for which one Adam do now? Eve is Adam's wife. So what crime has Adam committed by sleeping with his wife. I will explain the thing to you now. God said, because you hack him to the voice of your wife, as I explained to you on Wednesday, it means that after Eve committed that sin with the serpent, she did not get Adam to torture immediately. She spent some time, some days, perhaps, trying to convince him to do it with her. Eventually, Adam agreed to do it. Okay, that's his wife. A man does not need permission to go into his wife. So then why did God punish Adam? The answer is simple. Adam has rights to go into the wife. But at the time that Adam went into the wife, that was not the time that God said he should do so. That was the sin of Adam. It's not that he went into his wife. It's that he did it before God asked him to do so. Now you are going to ask yourself, you are going to say, I uh, must they get permission from God to do it? Yes, sir. Look in the animal world, and that's the sentence I'm going to end up with. Check all these fowls. All these animals, not the ones they produce in laboratory, though. These chick, these fowls, that uh, fowls, dogs, cats, all of them that are natural. The female side of them will never allow any male to enter into her, unless at that particular time, which in, uh, uh, in the animal science they call is the period of heat. It's a natural thing that God put inside of them. When that time happens, when that time comes, and the milk comes in, the woman will let the milk. And once that happens, the woman will not allow any milk to touch her again because it will be pregnancy straight away. That's how God did it. It is still today holding in the animal world. But in the sense, anywhere, any place, any time. That is why overpopulation happened shortly after the death of Eden in Genesis chapter 6. And it is still troubling us till today because there's no more control. Man can, man, meaning human being, can have sex anytime, any moment, any minute. 
But in the animal world, created at the same time as man, it is regulated by God's natural law inside of them. Man lost that when Adam chose to go into Eve before God's time for him was due. So that is the sin of Adam, not because he went into his wife. We will stop here so that everybody can go. But I think we have done enough for tonight. I hope you have been able to understand some of the things that are said. Of course, if there is anything that is not clear to you, you can always ask the questions. Ask for a ticket or ask us directly. You have my number. You can send your text or send your post to WhatsApp to SMS. We'll answer them. This Wednesdays and Friday thing is for you to understand the beginning of the Bible. It's because the churches don't have, most of the churches, the vast majority of the churches don't have this knowledge of what happened, have this correct knowledge. That is why it's so difficult after, excuse me, afterwards to be able to follow other things that are in the Bible. But you have heard now, I'll be quite willing to answer your questions. May God bless you for being around today in the mighty name of Jesus. So let us pray. Our Father and our God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord. We thank you because you have spoken to us, your children. You have explained your word to us. You have given us understanding by your spirit. What we are asking for now is that as your children go, Father, give us more revelation of your word that you spoke to us here by your spirit, Father, experience deeper to this your children. And for those of them who have uh, a sheep that they are shepherds to, that they will be able to also teach them. And those of us who have not, we are also still in your vineyard, that we can go out there and be able to share your word with others. May the Lord, the spirit that gave us this knowledge tonight, May it continue to be with us in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, O oh God Almighty, see us through this night, see us through this weekend. Do not allow the powers of hell to come anywhere near us to trouble us in any shape or form, spiritually or temporally. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, you are Lord, you are God, the be all and end all of our existence. Jehovah El Shaddai, the Almighty, all sufficient God, and great bestower and nourisher and succor. Jehovah Jari and great provider. Father God, hear the prayers of your people. Help them out to God with all the ways they are crying out to you. For life is difficult at this time, yet you own the universe and all that you are in it, and you are the one who distributes to your children. Remember us, your children, as you distribute to us in the mighty name of Jesus. Our Father and our God, we pray, bring healing into our lives and continue to fight all the battles of our lives that no power of hell be able to move against us and triumph in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, because you have answered our prayers. Bless you be the Holy Spirit. For in Jesus Christ's name we pray. I thank you for listening. I pray that we try to be on time because we have just one hour. Today we started well.